I'm put off by these protests. In April, we did the same thing just for one week. And as a result of that, we're in the media every single day. So it worked. A while ago, someone drew my attention to a tweet that said something like, if someone as anti-climate activism as Malin Baker thinks X, then it must really say something. It's not an unreasonable assumption. I mean, I've done numerous videos in the past criticising the Extinction Rebellion movement. But am I really against climate or indeed any other kind of activism? If not, what's the difference between what I would support, what I would criticise, or more broadly put, how do you do issue campaigning right? How can you tell if what you're doing is making any kind of difference? Well, let's have a look. Let's be clear from the start. I am not against anybody campaigning for an issue, a cause that they care passionately about. And I don't even much care whether or not it's an issue that I would personally support or even trenchantly oppose. The fact that people care enough about something to make an effort to support it. It's a fantastic part of what makes us human, what makes life interesting. People making their case, right or wrong, is part of the dynamism of a democratic society, which I support. Now, you can hear there's a but coming. But if people engage in stupid campaigning, campaigning that's counterproductive to their intended goal, I'm going to mention it if I'm analysing it. And I say this as someone who started his adult life involved arguably with exactly that sort of stupid campaigning. So let's talk about that for a moment. My own time as an activist, long decades ago though it may be, in my late teens and early 20s, the Cold War was at its height and it was obviously highly possible we could end up as the victims of a literal apocalypse. Now, I was scared of that, of course. I also watched all the documentaries and read all the first-hand accounts of what happened at Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the two places where nuclear bombs had been dropped on civilian populations. And I was horrified at the idea that my government nuclear power in its own right, had the policy of first use of such weapons, inevitably including civilian targets. The phrase war crime doesn't come close to describing it. So I got heavily involved in campaigning against nuclear weapons. And I did all of the stuff. I lived for a while at a peace camp, organised, took part in significant sized demonstrations. Indeed, I peacefully broke the newly introduced bylaws that prohibited hanging banners on the fence of a military base, and yes, went to prison as a result. For a token couple of weeks anyway. So there you go, activist cred, right there. Looking back on that period, it's easy to see that I was morally right and strategically and tactically completely wrong. Morally right? Well, of course, the basic case that it would be profoundly immoral to use nuclear weapons is pretty unanswerable. At that point, nuclear Armageddon was on a hair trigger. When you're young and facing that as your immediate future, then sure, removing your consent from what your government may be about to do in your name, it's the protest of the powerless. Sometimes it's all you've got. Would our political leaders have actually pressed the button, short of a retaliation to an incoming massive strike? Who knows? It was a game of bluff and counter-bluff. Mutually assured destruction only worked if the other side believed you fully intended to go through with it. And it came very close to going wrong. I mean, terrifyingly, ridiculously close. In 1983, Soviet early warning systems gave an alert that it could say with high reliability that five American Minutemen intercontinental ballistic missiles had been launched. One officer, Lieutenant Colonel Stanislav Petrov, theoretically had no discretion but to immediately sound the alert, which would have led to the automatic launch of a major response. No time for double checking. Instead, he used his discretion, decided the instruments were in error and did not act. The most consequential right call of our times. So thanks to him, we can point to the fact the major powers of the West played their hands well, the Soviet Union collapsed as it ran out of steam, trying to match the West in a spiralling arms race. So the government was right and people like me were wrong, definitely. But by heck we dodged a bullet and took the most enormous gamble 
In that situation, you should expect that people will protest because the implications of your policy, should it turn out not to be bluff, are monstrous. But yes, the peace movement led by the organisation, the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament, led a relatively stupid campaign. Unilateral disarmament in the face of a hostile enemy was not going to somehow motivate them to do likewise. It served the Soviet Union's interest that there was an anti-nuclear weapons movement in the West. The world would not have been more peaceful, almost certainly the contrary, if it had been successful. Because the world then, as we've seen it still does today, largely runs on the exercise of power. So lesson number one, you can be morally right in the abstract and strategically wrong. It matters what you're asking for, in other words. Let me give a case study of campaigning done right. Now, there are plenty of ways to do it right. This is just one of them, but just so that I can be concrete. My old friend, Ron Bailey, who I interviewed a couple of years ago for the audio podcast that I did then, he is a remarkable character. He has gotten more parliamentary bills passed, sometimes in the face of a hostile government, than most government ministers and certainly any backbench MPs. His technique was to identify a small but significant step towards a bigger goal. So his first ever target was access to information, the right of citizens to get access to documents and minutes from local authority proceedings. He's also done home energy conservation, road traffic reduction, climate change, various things, and he always has a couple of such bills on the go. First, he defines a specific law that could be passed. This is written up into the form of a bill that could be passed by Parliament, what's called a private member's bill. So he was very clear about what he wanted to be done. Because you couldn't have woolly ambiguities in a parliamentary bill. It has to be specific. Now every year there's a ballot of backbench MPs. The top 20 get to introduce what's called the private members bill. Only the top 10 in the ballot have the prospect of getting enough parliamentary time to get their bill passed. Before Ron's campaigning, these were often used lightly. A worthy bill that could be introduced to generate some local publicity in the constituency, but would probably not get passed. Because mostly the bills were debated on a Friday, when the majority of MPs were in their constituencies, so there might not even be a quorum in the chamber to enable a vote. But Ron mobilised a campaign targeting those MPs. He initiated lots of grassroots campaigning that looked to sign up influential groups and institutions in their constituencies. If the MP was Conservative, then... Women's institutes and other respectable organisations would be the target. If Labour, the groups would be different, the ones most likely to be influential with that MP. The point was, by the time the ballot came round, all the MPs should have had a certain amount of correspondence from people that they were not inclined to dismiss about that issue. Ron was then well positioned when the results of the ballot came in to approach the MPs who had come out at the top, point out to them that here was a bill ready drafted on a popular issue they'd been hearing about. So rather than just doing something token or symbolic, here was a bill they could get through. An important law their constituents wanted that could have their name attached to it. As you can imagine, it's a pretty persuasive pitch that yielded results more often than it didn't. Once an MP had taken on the bill, then the lobbying would start in earnest, with all the various groups contacting their MPs to support the bill and to make sure that they turned up for the debates. Ron's first bill, the Local Government Access to Information Act, was passed in spite of the fact that the Thatcher government was hostile to it and had a huge majority in the House. People in the party just told the whips there was so much support amongst their constituents for this bill, they dared not vote against it. That wasn't always the case in future years, of course, especially as people became familiar with Ron and his approach, and it served narrow, targeted bills better than broad, expansive ones. Nevertheless, he got a huge number of bills passed over the years. That's just one way of campaigning. It won't suit lots of campaigns with different objectives, but the point why it was effective campaigning are the following. One, it was clear about the change that was wanted and how it could be brought about. Two, it was clear who the target audience for the campaigning was, what was the desired end of addressing them. This meant communications could be targeted smartly to make the most of available resources and it could be done in a way that's more likely to get the desired response from the targets. 
Three, it wasn't an ego campaign. It wasn't about virtue signalling. It wasn't about making Ron Bailey famous, at least not to anyone who wasn't useful in achieving the goal. It was about getting a bill passed. That meant the MP who took the bill on became the face for it, got all the credit as far as most people were concerned. Key lesson about campaigning and indeed life, you can very often change the world if you don't mind who gets the credit. Four, the campaign was executed with consistent energy and discipline and over a realistic timescale. Ron generally reckoned that for most sorts of the bills that he took on, there was a three-year process that would be needed to take all the steps to get to a successful end result. So those are some key principles. Now let's consider the modern form of climate activism as seen with Extinction Rebellion and its manifold offshoots. First, does it have a clear campaign objective? Well, when it started, it did have, although it wasn't officially put up front. It's well documented and attested that when the original group was started by a bunch of leftist activists, the aim was to overthrow the government using the climate change issue as the cause that could mobilise lots of people onto the streets. Now, that is... A rather specific objective in one way. It was never remotely clear what was supposed to happen after the government had been overthrown. It didn't seem to be a plan. It's hard not to conclude that it was a delusional objective, but it was at least clear. And it did shape what they did. That's why they promoted vague goals, climate ones that demanded impossible rapidity that could never be delivered in the real world. I'm guessing that they wanted to ensure the government couldn't take the wind out of their sails by simply agreeing to do what they were asking. And the other thing they promote is the Citizens' Assembly. So they have no clear ideas about what should be done about climate change, but they have a great interest in an idea about how decisions should be made and by whom because the Citizens' Assembly was intended to become the key decision-maker, not Parliament. They felt that if you painted an apocalyptic picture enough to young people about their dismal futures because of climate change, you would persuade them to sign up to do radical things, getting arrested and going to jail type things, like the young Malin, convinced that nuclear holocaust was just around the corner. Yes, that's what it takes. Now, the objectives were delusional for several reasons. First, as soon as you recruit lots of young people concerned about climate change, they will dilute your political purpose because they joined for a different reason, namely to do something about climate change. Modern campaign movements are particularly difficult because they romanticise a very loose collective leadership. That usually means a complete absence of clarity and discipline. So as soon as you've recruited your army of civilly disobedient campaigners, they're probably going to rebel against you. And so it was that Roger Hallam ended up ejected from Extinction Rebellion and he had to keep creating new offshoots of smaller bands of people more loyal to his vision and ideas. So look, that's the original fantasy version of XR. If you look at the campaign as it is now, largely made up of people who are just worried about climate change, albeit mostly surrounded by people who would identify to some degree as being of the left. Is there a clear campaign goal? No. They still argue that nothing is being done about climate change and therefore big protests need to happen. However, it's not true. In the UK, we have had for several years now government committed to net zero emissions by 2050. Now that came from an expert committee, the Committee on Climate Change, that put in the work over several years to identify all the steps you would have to take in order to reach net zero. Which would have to be done first, which ones couldn't be started until others have been completed, which could be done quickly, which would necessarily take longer. And having done all of that work, they then came up with a view that a deadline of 2050 was possible and the government adopted that. Possible might still mean politically overambitious. That's another discussion for another day. The US, albeit with rather less coherent process and a questionable legislative route map, has adopted the same target. The big current emitters are China and India. China is a big short-term problem, but has adopted a net zero programme for 2060. India is the poorest country with many people to pull out of poverty, the biggest percentage of dependency on coal. Consequently, it's looking at net zero by 2070. Numerous other countries across the world, the EU, countries like Japan, South Korea, have all committed to similar targets, mostly 2050. 
A number of the largest multinational corporations have committed to net zero for their entire value chain. So from the extraction of their raw materials through to the end disposal or recycling of their products. Those are not easy problems to solve. It takes time, especially when you have industries like fast fashion, electronics and the like. They're making some pretty big investments to do so. Plenty of others are not, for sure. Nevertheless, do the campaigners give any recognition at all to all of that activity? Do they have an analysis to say it could be done faster or better or just different? No. Right now, there are plenty concerned that maybe it's being pushed too fast. Given the geopolitical realities, do the campaigners have any response to that argument? No, because their campaign premise depends on the mythology that nobody's doing anything. So there's no detail to unpick, no action to defend. If you want to change the world, you have to see the world clearly, as it is, not how it's convenient for you to imagine it to be. What about the target audience? Are they clear about who they're seeking to influence and to what end? Again, the answer is no. They're doing outrageous stuff, hoping it thereby gets covered on the news. So long as people are talking about the issue, they say, then it must be helping. And they will point to how many people think the issue is important and they'll say, we did that. Now, that is obviously an evidence-free assertion. Given that the actions have frequently been designed to obstruct and inconvenience ordinary people, it's an act of extraordinary faith to argue that this helps. My son is 11. He needs to get to school today. So move out of the way and let me get my son to school. This is stupidity. If you want to, if you want to, if you want to, One could equally say, back in 2018, when then Prime Minister Theresa May signed up to net zero by 2050, having received the reports of the Committee on Climate Change, that there was no opposition to that move. There was almost no debate about it. Generally, everyone accepted it was what needed to be done. Since then, after four years of Extinction Rebellion, gluing themselves to things, disrupting people on their daily commutes, letting down people's tyres, smashing up petrol station pumps, we now have a growing tide of political opposition to net zero within the governing party. Is it cause and effect? Well, maybe. I mean, given the types of people the campaigners often target, you might say they've done a pretty good job at pissing off the very people who would vote for Conservatives. The answer, though, is probably not. The answer is that it's more likely a response to the fact that government is indeed doing things on net zero for all that campaigners give them zero credit for it, and actions create reactions. But then how do those critics of net zero seek support for their cause? One of the ways is to point at XR antics in some of their literature. Their favoured talk radio hosts invite XR representatives onto their shows to harangue them to the applause of their listeners. It's not eco-terrorism. We're a non-violent, peaceful protest organisation. It is eco-terrorism under the Terrorism Act of the year 2000. You should go and read it. It is, it is provably eco-terrorism because you are threatening the government uh, with law-breaking that is putting people's lives and property at risk. So if you think XR's actions are in no way counterproductive, you might want to consider why that happens. Well, all right then, Alan, some might say. What would be a climate activism strategy that you would approve of? Well, just as a thought experiment, since I don't campaign on this channel, apart from the occasional broadside on the need for free speech. OK, but really, you could brainstorm it yourself based on the principles that I've outlined here. So you'd start by framing your objective, something that could mobilise support and would have a chance of making a solid contribution to the good. My headline assessment is this. The most important heavy lifting in decarbonisation is needed elsewhere. But your ability to influence China and India and Saudi Arabia, pretty limited. It's not impossible. But working that through is probably beyond the scope of this video. Within the UK, you have a government that's committed in principle to net zero by 2050. All the opposition parties likely to have any voice in a future government are bought into that target as well. And the electorate largely support that goal in principle. So it's hard to see that a wide campaign of persuasion on the key issue is what's needed. 
the pivot points seem to be these. One, a climate campaigner would want to face down any chance of the growing backlash to net zero gaining additional currency amongst the decision makers. That would be a campaign aimed at persuasion of conservative grassroots parties and their elected representatives. It would have to look very different to XR to have any chance of success. You'd have to care about not just net zero, but net zero done right. Because the backlash is feeding off ill-conceived, badly implemented policy. Because let's be clear, terrible policies brought in with good intentions can lose support for a cause faster than almost anything else. Net zero done right. Reducing carbon emissions while still feeding people, protecting energy security, net zero done right, finding the approach that works with people the way they are, not the utopian lifestylers you might romanticise on their behalf. One of the biggest contributions a climate campaign would make worldwide would be to make the political right believe that they could own the issue by defining net zero done right. Because there are going to be changes of government. If every time the pendulum swings one way, you get people who dismantle everything that the people who did before, you're not going to solve long-term problems that they fundamentally disagree on. You need the politicians to agree on the ends, while debating and showing their distinctiveness when it comes to the means. Now maybe you'll say to that, but the people we have who want to campaign on this are young people and therefore relatively leftist, if not particularly politicised. They are people who are worried for the future. They are not the ones who could lead a campaign directed at the political right. Well, OK, is the purpose of the campaign to be influential on solving the problem or just giving you something nice to do? I mean, Ron Bailey's campaigners were not conservatives when they got the Access to Information Bill through Parliament. Far from it. But they saw communication as something you tailor to the person you're trying to persuade, rather than something you do from a position of self-indulgence. But all right, OK, create a new positive, hopeful campaign, clearly distinguished from XR, aimed at reassuring young people that they can make a difference to the issue without living in terror that they're going to die soon. That's needed. Seek allies in businesses and amongst powerful influencers, because they are there. And a movement that's more constructive and solutions focused will definitely attract them. But again, frame your objectives. If not political, then, I don't know, identify the top thousand most important decision makers in relation to the things that are going to matter. Target getting them to make a solid commitment. Or the top hundred decision makers, or ten. Work out what are the routes to influence those people. Like Ron Bailey, be clear what it is you want to have happen, who you need to lobby on your behalf. Now, for most people, I'm guessing that sounds like more work than they thought they were signing up for. And that's the problem with these informal campaigns. Certainly, this was my experience all those decades ago. The people that become part of them say that they're there because it's the most important cause in the world right now and they have to do their bit. That doesn't mean that they want to put in hard work to getting it right or to do the parts that are more grind and less fun. Most people are there to show their support, to identify themselves as the sort of people who care about these issues. What some disparagingly refer to as virtue signalling, but really is a perfectly valid expression of identity. And this is really what the climate movement has been in recent years. Like CND before it, it was largely about developing a specific issue to be a tool of the left to seek to win people over to support for its parties. And sure, in the climate movement, there'll be plenty of people like I was in CND in my time, not politically affiliated, not seeing that the issue should belong to any particular political tradition. I realise now that partisans saw people like me as irrelevant at best, part of the enemy at worst. The only real mismatch though comes if you swallow the lie that nobody's doing anything, and if only you protest hard enough you can save the world. It's not what's going on here. Look, lots of people in government, in businesses, in NGOs are working on different parts of the problem of climate change. You can show up and remind people that you care. You can demonstrate and wave banners and send emails. Polite ones work better. All of that. 
and just accept what you're doing is encouraging those that are doing, reminding them that people are watching. But it's not all about you. You are not saving the world. You're cheering on the people who are doing the actual work or calling attention to where those people have fallen short, so long as you're able to articulate precisely how that happened. And that's fine. Sometimes when something happens, it's good that a bunch of people get hacked off about it, go on to the streets, wave some signs around, an expression of deeply felt opinion, and nobody expects any more of them. Nobody expects that is going to change the world on its own, but it's part of the process. But if you're going to turn it into an ongoing campaign, because the issue is such an important one, then you owe it to yourself and the difference you want to make in the world to do it well so that you do good rather than unintentionally doing harm. One of the things you need to learn is a solid understanding of how things really work and how you can create change. I made a video looking at one of the most important things that you need to know. Literally everyone who changes the world is good at this. So if you've made it this far, you might want to watch that video next.